Hey all, I wanted to do this video for quite some time or these kind of videos for quite some time where I introduce you a little in depth to the various and different cars in ACC. Because if you've seen the last couple of days and maybe even weeks by now, I've spent some time with the latest Porsche 992 GT3 R in order to provide very drivable and also fast setups that are usable for a wide variety of players and not just the top 0.1% that can handle a car on the edge. Along the way, of course, I found my way around the car, learned to understand it, and now I want to share with you my thought process when I go into a setup, the settings I choose for various aspects and traits of the car, and then hopefully you're smarter after the video. So let's go. Let's take it to Silverstone where I will also provide the quality setup that I've built at the end of the session in the link below for you to get to feel the difference that I'm trying to get across in this video. Silverstone, one of the trickiest track because high downforce in a lot of the corners and also various situations like here in the S's where you are changing direction pretty quickly at very high speed while slowing down, which puts the car in a very delicate situation where the downforce plays the major role and therefore controlling that downforce also becomes a key area. This is also where probably the like very fast but hard to control setups differ the most from still quick or rather fast setups but the rather stable side of things is in how they tap into and how they control the aerodynamic balance in the car around a lap. And we certainly all know the situations where you drive the Porsche, you take the foot off the gas and it immediately tries to kill you. Make it worse if you step on the brake, it doesn't just want to kill you, it probably succeeds. At least that is the case for a lot of people. Of course you can feel like ninja and a superhero if you're able to make those very fine adjustments on throttle, brake and steering that is required to keep the car just about on the edge there and get around the circuit in a very fast way. That is certainly possible, but of course not everybody has the hardware and also the talent to do that. So let me try to help you in this video to get away from these super tricky situations and get the car in a more neutral way where it behaves predictably around a full lap. Let's start with a quick overview of the car and most notably in the Porsche is of course in difference to all cars that we have the fuel tank actually in the front of the car which kind of frames all driving behavior in a race stint and at the other hand then we of course have a splitter at the front as all cars have so this one doesn't really make it special. And I think on the 992, the splitter is also not adjustable anymore where it was on the older version of the car. More importantly then is that at the rear, we have the engine, which is where the Porsche is still unique, maybe similar to the Honda, which also frames the car behavior quite a lot. And to control this weight, the car does have a massive rear wing there in order to get the grip onto the road. Additionally, there is the diffuser, which we can use to control the car behavior over the course of a lap, depending on what the circuit asks from the car. Let's first take a look at Silverstone itself and get an understanding what the track actually requires of us. If we look at turn one, we know the epic speed is something around 170, 180, so high speed corner. If you just look at the shape of the corners that follow afterwards, you can see, well, they are probably faster than turn one. So this is something like 220, still something around 160, and I guess that's 140, 130. So a downforce corner as well. The same is true for the next one here, the stow corner, I believe. And then we have a bit of a chicane down here, fast corner, super high speed corner, 210 at the apex or more. Um, the next one is flat out as well, followed by two hairpins again, flat out there. And then this is very tricky, a very long trail breaking into this ever tightening corner, also requiring good stability in the car in order to handle this very deep braking. And then followed by 
the left field, I believe. Never ending last corner of the circuit, which is rather slow. Needs some mechanical balance, depending what we want there. Could be oversteery, could be understeery, whatever. We'll get there. Just to have a track profile. Overall, we know this is a lot of downforce. We need stability in all these different situations. And the key here is that, especially in the SS, the car is always slowing down, which means it is pitching forward. The front goes closer to the ground, the rear goes up, which makes the car really sensitive. The same is true here for the stow corner, where the car is pitching forward very deep into the corner, long trailing until a very late apex in that corner. Um, and then we have the same thing here pretty much in the quick right-hander that also slows the car down until the apex, but we're never really fully off throttle there. So it's not quite as sensitive as those steep trailings we have here as well. So what does that all mean? And we're going to go into the setup page actually to get an idea of what I am trying to achieve. I'm not showing you the HIMO setup where the whole idea was sparked because it was super sensitive, but I can tell you it is very soft and it allows a lot of movement of the car. And now I'm just going to show you the quality setup that I built because this is also what I've put on Discord for you to have, but I also wrapped it all in the data pack that you can get on Popometer to also compare the driving line and the inputs to understand how to shuffle this car around the track. Now, there are a few things in ACC that are always quite certain. You'll most likely get a way to start a setup with full cambers and only very late in the process you might make changes to that should the balance not be as you desire. So when we have a high speed track like that, it's very likely we'll just run max camber because the car is leaning so much over to the sides and the camber is changing so much that we'll probably need the maximum to utilize the entire tire. Then we have the whole negative toe situation. You can use a bit more on the front, which does two things. First, more negative toe gives a tiny bit of a delay to the steering, so makes it a tiny bit less responsive. We're talking really fractions here, but they can be important in the Porsche. And additionally, the inside wheel is just ever so slightly going to help pull the car through the corner. Um, overall, I would probably put this setting very far to the back as its impact is not that big to the overall balance of the car. Then having the caster on many cars, you'll just run the maximum to break it down. The caster can help retain camber in the corner. It will have some impact on how the car takes bumps, but it will also affect the balance depending on how the camber is retained in the corner, the more you steer or lost, the more you steer. Pressure wise, we all know we're aiming for this 26 and a half to 27 PSI, something like that. So we'll leave it at that. But the more important stuff is coming now where we are going into the mechanical section which also controls the arrow, but we should probably start with the arrow. The key thing in the car is, and you'll always see the eSport setups have a lot of rake. Rake, they, I, I hear this a lot, that people refer to rake as solely the rear right height. This is wrong. Rake is the difference of front to rear right height. Okay, so this here is a rake of 37. This is a rake of two. Okay. This is the rear right height here of 66. So just to get the terminology straight here. So we are running a rake of 12 on the setup and you'll typically see 14, 15, 16, something like maybe even 17 on the esports setup. So it doesn't sound that much of a difference in numbers, but it is in fact quite a bit of a difference in how the car drives. The key that is down here, the aerodynamic balance. And um, you can't take this number and put it to another car. It's just going to work differently. So this number is like only true for the Porsche 992 GT3R. No other car is usable with these numbers. So only refer to these percentage numbers for the car that you're setting up and ignore whatever it is for other cars, right? Treat them in isolation. So now what you're going to see is the situation we have is under braking, 
the rear is going to lift up, the front is going to go down. So what we're going to get is more rake as we break. And let's just add, and the car moves a bit, right? It's not just a millimeter, it's not just a 10 centimeter, it's probably two centimeters or something. So what we're going to have is a rear end that is suddenly a lot higher than it was initially. And if you just look down at the number, we get quite a significant balance change there in the car. And what I can't show you right now is, but what of course has also happened, and that's just because we are already minimum on the front here, is of course the front ride height gets less as well. And if you just take a look what happens when we lower the ride height from say 60 to 50, we are also gaining one and a half percent of balance towards the front. And this pattern just keeps going the lower the front goes. So it's probably sitting at 40 or even less um, when you brake the car, which means we suddenly have a rake that is something like 40 millimeters, which just means the car is super sensitive. And this is also what you feel when you hit the brake into those corners, swing the car around. So we still need this rake to get the car around the corner. And if we accelerate out of the corners, of course, the rear compresses goes down. So we're losing a bit of this downforce on the rear or we're losing a bit of this balance that we're seeking. The car gets more neutral on power. Also, additionally, the front is going to lift up a bit and suddenly on acceleration, we have a way different balance. So this is key to understand for everything that you ever do in any downforce dependent car. OK, how the ride heights change over the course of a lap and how that affects car behavior in different driving situations. So under braking, gets super sensitive. Under acceleration, gets very neutral. Okay, I'm exaggerating the numbers here, but the car changes a lot. I just wanted you to have that idea. So what do we do to control this rake when this seems to be an issue? Well, we go to the mechanic section and you can see here what I have done. For Silverstone then, what we are trying to achieve is, because we have these high speed corners, we want to keep the car rotating on power. So the first way is to think about, okay, how do we keep the rear up in the air to keep this balance where we want it to have it, right? We don't want the rear all the way down because it makes the car way too neutral. We just want to have it in the air a little. And this is mainly where we use the bump stop range and the bump stop rate as like a hard limit to what the car will be allowed to do under acceleration. And you can see I wanted to keep the rear quite in check. That is why the bump stop range is rather low. And you will really be able to tell differences if you just increase the rate or the range. It will be quite noticeable on exit, either giving you a lot more oversteer or understeer. In the same area, you're playing with the real weight, but also the wheel rate is going to have quite the impact in all mechanical dominated situations, which is where the slower corners, the hairpins and the chicane will come into play. Then at the front, you would think, OK, we have to control the situation there quite a bit as well um, and not allow the front to move as much. But then again, you can see I chose quite a bit of bump stop range on the front, at least in reference to what we are using around a lot of cars in the game or in previous patches or the stock setup has very little bump stop range. This seems quite a bit, so let me explain. In turn, I made the front spring quite a bit stiffer. And since we know the fuel tank is at the front and in the quality trim, the front doesn't have a lot of weight. This means the front is also not moving a lot as I hit the brake, just because the spring is stiff enough to handle it. On the other hand, I get a lot of compliance from the front end when I allow a lot of movement over bumps, for example, or curbs. And another third factor that might be underrated a bit, if you give the front some range, you will not run into the bump stops very harshly, which means you won't have sudden spikes in grip creation and grip loss on the front axle. And this suddenness in the front axle, that really creates the problems that you are later seeing in car behavior. So taking out the suddenness of the front end or response, this helps a lot in keeping the Porsche predictable and drivable. 
And you can achieve this in several ways. You could just give it a very soft bump stop rate and not allow it so much range. But then you also lose some flexibility of changing the downforce balance on the brake, for example. And also you could make the spring softer, but that comes with other problems we'll see then in the mechanical sections. Overall, a stiff car is going to be more predictable than a soft car. And overall, on most cars, the front downforce is going to react more sensitive than the rear downforce. So allowing the car to move up and down on the front axle is going to have a bigger aerodynamic impact than allowing the rear to move up and down. Maybe one more thought to add there. The harder the spring is on the rear, just imagine a super stiff spring and then you put one kilogram on top. And then you take that kilogram away. Does the spring do anything? Not really. Take in turn a very soft spring. Think of something really, really soft, okay? It almost moves as you breathe on it. You put a kilogram on it, it compresses completely, right? Take the kilogram off, it extends a lot. So just to give you that idea, when you brake the car and take a bit of weight from the rear axle on the soft spring, the rear is going to extend a lot. And if you have a very stiff spring on the rear and you brake, the rear is not going to extend a lot. The same then applies, and we're really only staying in the screen, okay? The same thing then applies if you go for the stint in a car and the Porsche is really special there. So the fuel is now set to 13 liters. So let's just mimic that. And this is one of the most powerful tools really that ACC has employed here. And I think iRacing, for example, has a tool of the fuel tester. So this is now the aerodynamic balance we're going to have. The car has 13 liters of fuel, okay? Now, if you went onto the track, came back to the pits and refueled during a pit stop, to say a full tank, just see what the car is going to do. The front now compressed because the fuel tank is at the front. We are losing three millimeters in right height. The front goes closer to the ground, okay? And the rear pretty much stays in place, indicating you where the fuel tank is placed, in this case, at the front. Now let's just do this example once more, or in the other way, right? Now we start with the full tank, the tank empties as the race progresses and now we have a balance of 6.5 percent and now the tank empties and we are back to a balance of 5.8 so just a shift of 0.7 percent and again this doesn't mean a lot on other cars it's solely a thing on the porsche and it's just a number a higher number isn't necessarily more sensitive or, or something okay on another car just take it as it is okay and you really have to learn your car and what a 0.1 or 1% change on that car really means balance wise because it differs a lot between the cars. So this is what happens then on the portion. Let's uh, just for example, actually start with a full tank. And now you see we're starting at 53 millimeters. And as we go through the right stint, the front is going to rise to 56 while the rear stays exactly in place or even going to 57 if we take it further. So it's four millimeters up on the front changing the balance rearward, making the car more stable aerodynamically by almost a good percent. This is with a rather stiff spring. So let's make that example again with the softest available spring. So we're going back to the arrow. Again, we have a full tank, 53 millimeters. Now the tank empties over the course of a stint. And you can see now with the softest spring, we even get one additional millimeter of um, balance change, which does change the percentage value by quite a bit more. So just to give you an understanding of what it means running a stiff spring and having huge balance changes throughout the race because of the emptying tank or having a very stiff spring on the front where we would get much less of a balance change on the front, even though we're just talking one millimeter here okay so the, the porsche got much better in that regard compared to the old porsche because the 991 reacted very very aggressively to every millimeter of right height change on the front and here the the 992 is pretty much tamed right if the front rises 0 0.2 another 0.3 another 0.2 it's very subtle changes and on the old porsche like this was full percent 
on, on every click and it was really, really impactful. So it had huge balance changes throughout the race. And this has already become a lot better in the 992. So this, these are some of the thoughts that are really going on when, when you're doing a race set. And all the time you were able to see the rear doesn't react at all to all these changes because the fuel tank is so much in the front that the rear doesn't care at all. This also means that the rear is always going to stay in that position and throughout the race, you are losing that precious rake. Now, the other thing with the Porsche is, imagine with a full tank, the car has a 50-50 well, weight balance, okay? And now as the, where's the front? The tank empties and now the weight balance kind of goes away from the front and suddenly you have quite the weight advantage of the rear end, which is typically what makes the Porsche more sensitive as the race progresses, okay? So you have suddenly much more weight on the rear that wants to move around and you suddenly don't have weight on the front anymore and thus doesn't want to move around. So the thing is, as the tank empties, the front end of the car becomes more agile because there's not so much weight that wants to keep going straight and the car is more likely to respond to your steering inputs. The only thing in the car that works against that is this aero balance. So in the Porsche, you could argue you want quite the big change in terms of aero balance to counter this massive shift in the weight balance. Okay. And it really comes down to testing on each particular track and how much of a balance change you can personally handle as a driver. But overall, you wanted to keep the car as neutral as possible going through the stint. And of course, you would think the engineers have already kind of tried to build that into the car. The more the front rises, the more the tank empties that the aerodynamic effect and the weight balance effect are kind of equaling each other out. Um, but of course, that only works on fast tracks where you actually have a lot of aerodynamic corners on the track. If you only have a track that is mechanically dominated, so very slow one, like say Alton or wherever we don't have a lot of downforce corners, I can't think of one right now, maybe Misano or something. There you would have the mechanical balance problem much more pronounced because the aero change isn't that important on that track because you're most often going slow. So kind of Silverstone is a good example for the car because those effects are going to level one another. Then we probably want to talk quickly about this balance of the springs itself. And I tend to want to set them up in a way where I give the heavier end of the car. Of course, these cars are all aimed to be somewhat 50-50 weight balance, okay? But they often have some variations where it's like 52, 48, something like that. And the Porsche certainly has a ballot advantage for the rear. So this is more heavy and I want to give the stiffer spring to the end that is more heavy in the car. Additionally, what I want to achieve here in the Porsche is that I, the general problem of the car is that the front will be the better part of the car. The front is more likely to change direction and more easy to cope with it. And the rear is kind of always on the back foot in the car. So if you do a steering input, the front changes direction and the rear is always in the situation where it's like, hey, wait for me. And you have, you can kind of build this into the car that the rear has a better chance to cope with sudden changes on the front. And this is also what I tried to explain earlier, why I'm giving the front that much range. So we are never getting grip spikes on the front, or at least if we're getting them, because the whole suspension is compressing aggressively over a bump or something, we are not getting a huge response from the front end in terms of changing direction. So the rear is always staying in place. So one thing is by doing it in a way where you allow the front to move, and put the rear rather close to the bumps up so they're very the weight isn't allowed to move around as much and you're using the roll bars in a similar fashion where you control the weight transfer from one side to the other or also how quick it transfers from one side to the other but still the mechanical impact of these roll bars is also important because the slower you become the less downforce you have the stiffer the front roll bar the more understeery it is going to make the car and you can already tell by touching all these settings and by how they engage 
there is a huge amount of just trying out really how the car is going to respond on a given track. And this then is the thing where I'm cycling through as I build that setup. All this thought process, I never really know what um, my next step is going to be. Let me just touch on the dampers real quick before I show you a table, what I, which I like to use in order, well, I'm not actually using it, but this is like the different situations I go through in order to assess what the car is doing. So dampers, this is very different from what you'll see in a lot of other setups. And here again, what I'm trying to achieve is I'm trying to take response out of the front end and trying to make the front end move around and not have sudden changes in the grip level. So if the bump damping is rather soft and I turn the wheel, then the front end moves a bit, the weight moves around a bit before it is all suddenly pressed into the ground, which would happen if you had a very stiff damper. So the softer damper allows a longer time of movement until everything stops and settles and eventually the grip has created. If you make the bump damping on the front really stiff, you're going to have that weight change affect the grip level of the front tire quite aggressively. And this is something we do not want on the Porsche because the rear is always exposed in this car because of the engine sitting there at the back. On the other hand, we want quite a different thing. With the rear end of the car, we always wanted to find grip very quickly when we make a change of direction. So I'm always giving it very high bump damping here. So when I turn the wheel, the front moves a bit slowly, then kind of the rear changes the, the weight from one side to the other. And I want the rear to grab the grip basically before the front end does, or at least not so long after, but just in a reasonable amount of time that the rear never has a chance to really step out. So I'm making the rear so to say, react faster and have the weight settle earlier in an attempt to make the car more stable. So the dampers are influential there, not as much though as everything else that we touched on. Then how I use the rebound setting on the Porsche is to prevent the car from pitching forward a lot on the brake. So if you make that stiff, the rear doesn't as quickly extend on the braking and that keeps the rear in place a little longer when you break for turn one example on Silverstone. Then what I also don't like on the Porsche is I'm really just doing a lot of things here to keep the car stable. I remove rebound damping from the front and you'll see quite different approaches sometimes and in other cars as well, where they're going to run a lot of rebound damping on the front. And the target there is when you put the power down at the exit of the corner, the front rebound damping can help keep the front lower to the ground, which helps keep the downforce high on the front end of the car, which then again helps rotate the car around. So I'm choosing a low rebound damping here because I do not want to force the front to stay low. I actually want it to rise up a little to create a good stable balance, but in turn, I'm going to keep the rear up in the air with a bump stop range, for example. And again, the dampers have very little impact there. This here is going to be, I don't know, 10 times more influential. So this really is here fine tuning as you step on the throttle and figure out if the car is responding in the way that you like or that you don't. Let me see if there's actually any other part that we really need to talk about. I guess it will be around the negative camber. And it is probably best to I'm referring back to the famous PDF that I shared in the beginning of the new patch era. But essentially, the more negative the toe, the smaller the contact patch on the rear tires will be when you exit the corner. It's going to help to get a rear round, but it also makes the rear end very sensitive when you put the power down because everything is kind of forced through a smaller patch um, of the tire and that usually creates that huge sensitivity that you feel in all driving situations uh, plus the tires are pointing to the outside whenever you put load on them they really want to go um i think i'm gonna stop here i hope this was somehow making sense feel free and please do write comments Ask for the question. I'm trying to make sure to answer as much as I can. I'm not going to write essays there. So keep the uh, questions short and concise. Let's not do a 
big physics discussion that's just not going to work out in the comments. But any tiny things here, feel free to ask. I'll try to answer. And to drive that setup, just go to my Discord, to the Porsche channel, scroll up a bit, or just filter by and search for files posted by me. And then you'll find that setup. Or just go to popomator.io, where I posted the entire data pack, where you're going to have this quality setup. But you'll also have the race setup, which has a few changes in there to, you know, what I told you about the, the balance change and kind of respect that and kind of think ahead that we might get a more of a steering car later in the race. So the race setup style in a bit more on the steering to begin with. And then you can also compare your driving and you also very quickly, I think, see that this car can be fast in your hands. It can be fun to drive. It can be stable and it can be predictable. And it doesn't have to be the ultimate yeet machine that you sometimes get with other setups. So I'm going to call it the end of the video. And I thank you all for watching. I hope this wasn't too long. And I hope there still was enough detail in there for you to get an idea. Um, and then see you very soon. Bye.